It's my pleasure to welcome you to this event to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. So 100 years ago to this very day, Vladimir Lenin and his accomplices arrested the provisional government, which had been ruling Russia uh, since March uh, of that year, when the Tsar, uh, the last of the Romanov uh, monarchs, abdicated. Uh, and Lenin proclaimed that the peasant, the worker peasant revolution had been accomplished. A Marxist revolution aimed at a radical restructuring of politics, economics, society, culture. Now, perhaps this sounds uh, simple, perhaps it sounded simple at the time to, to declare the revolution achieved, but as is always the case, the devil is in the details. Revolutionary change cannot simply be enacted wholesale all at once, especially in a large, complex agrarian empire that was still mired in World War I in 1917. So what exactly needed to be reformed or discarded and replaced? How quickly or vigorously should change be enacted? What institutions and practices from the old way of life might be compatible with socialism? These are a few of the many questions that surrounded this takeover of power on that fateful day in November 1917. And to help us to better understand the complexities facing this new regime and what they're trying to achieve, we've invited to BYU a specialist on this topic, Ann O'Donnell, Assistant Professor of History and Russian and Slavic Studies at New York University. Dr. O'Donnell was educated uh, at Princeton. She, went then, she then went on to get a master's degree at Berkeley and then returned to Princeton for her PhD, which she finished in 2014. After a postdoc at Harvard, uh, she was hired at New York University, where she currently works. Uh, Anne is interested in the inner workings of the Bolshevik regime uh, in the years immediately following its seizure of power. Uh, specifically, she looks at state bureaucracies, property, money, and other valuables, and law, as the new regime tried to figure out exactly how to build socialism and what socialism meant. Uh, she has published uh, articles this year uh, in uh, a couple of journals and also in the New York Times. Uh, and her talk today is titled A Revolutionary Settlement, Personal Possession, and the Legal Closure of the Russian Revolution, 1917 to 1922. Please join me in welcoming Anne O'Donnell. Thank you all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, Jeff and I had the very pleasant realization that we had both sat down to write uh, quite similar introductory paragraphs uh, insofar as we were, we were both trained at Princeton and were in fact graduate students together. And it was, it was a lovely moment to feel the, the bonds of the past and also to, to feel the shared enterprise of learning about this fascinating event. Uh, 100 years ago today, as Jeff mentioned, the city of Petrograd woke up to what would become the great October Socialist Revolution, the dawn of a new era not just for Russia, but it was hoped and believed, and as it turned out to be, in fact, for all of humankind. The previous, that, that day, that evening, uh, in the middle of the night, a conspiratorial branch of the Bolshevik party, led by Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky, convinced armed bands of demobilized soldiers. As Jeff observed, we are still immersed in the history of the First World War at this moment. Uh, demobilized soldiers known as Red Guards who were home from the Eastern Front to back them up as they went about seizing the major elements of the communications infrastructure in the capital, centered on the telegraph posts and the railways, and eventually the seats of power that housed the provisional government that had been formed to replace the collapsed regime of the czars eight months before. News of the revolt, which some immediately began to call a coup, radiated out from Petrograd, primarily along the railways. As in February, some local authorities tried to suppress the telegraphs that were trickling in from the capital to stop the revolution, as it were, from entering their towns and cities, but they could not stop the trains from steaming in, and with them, with the arrival of people who bore word of what had happened in Petrograd. The many parts of the vast Russian empire reacted to the news of upheaval in Petrograd variously. In the spaces of empire where there were no trains, for example, even places that were in fact quite close to Petrograd itself, news of the revolution did not arrive for some weeks after the seizure of power. Uh, 
If in Petrograd the seizure of power was accomplished with virtually no bloodshed, and the Bolsheviks there found themselves issuing proclamations and orders, taking on the tasks of governance with dizzying speed, in Moscow, not even the local Bolsheviks were excited about the seizure of power, about this revolution, this turn of events. And when the forces of so-called counter-revolution, as the Bolsheviks would call them, although they were in their own minds defenders of the true revolution that had happened in February, when these forces uh, rose up in arms to protect the local institutions of the provisional government, the Muscovite Bolsheviks had to be hardened with copious and furious telegrams from Leningrad, from, from Lenin, rather, in Petrograd, exhorting them to fight. Street fighting in Moscow between the Petrograd loyalists on one side and Muscovites of various political stripes on the other lasted more than 10 days. And at one point, the Muscovite Junkers, as they, as they called themselves, these forces fighting against the Bolshevik coup, the Bolshevik seizure of power, the Junkers managed to capture almost the entire leadership of the Moscow Bolshevik party and to corral them in a jail. They could have killed them right then and there and stopped the spread of the Petrograd Revolution in its tracks. But, and this would be the story again and again, for the next year at least, they didn't take that opportunity. They dithered, reinforcements were sent, and that window, that moment that they had in which a decision, a fateful decision might have been made, and uh, that moment closed. Maybe because they were simply cowards, although given the fact that similar scenarios played out over and over again in other places and at other moments, it seems more likely that there was something deeper, something less contingent going on. Because they believed that the execution of one's political enemies was not how politics in the new Russian Republic should be conducted, and they were thus unwilling to mimic the Bolshevik strategies and zeal to their own detriment, or because they wondered or believed or feared that perhaps the Bolsheviks did represent the true revolution and that it was possible this true revolution could not be made without them. All of this is to say the Bolshevik revolution in this day that we celebrate, it did not have to last, not celebrate, observe, let's say. It did not have to last. It was fragile. It was contested. And in certain respects, it barely made its way out of Petrograd. But it did last. Indeed, not only did the revolution last, it came to appear to many inside the Soviet Union and beyond to be the inevitable and the true bearer of socialism into modern life and the modern world. And today I'd like to speak a bit about how that happened, about how the revolution in the particular shape that the Bolsheviks gave it embedded itself into the lives of ordinary people and thereby became durable. I will begin with the case of one woman whose name was Tika Brazova, citizeness Tika Brazova, as she was known in the language of the time, formerly of the city of Petrograd, and more lately, when we encounter her, uh, of the city of Armavir in the Caucasus. Tika Brazova traveled to the city of Armavir with her son, who was a railway engineer assigned to a posting there. And she left just days after the October Revolution, 100 years ago, just days from that fateful moment. She remained there for the duration of the Civil War, and this was both necessary because just a few months after she arrived in Armavir, rail lines connecting the region to the Russian capitals were cut off by fighting. And it was also prudent, because it allowed her to sit out the war in relative safety, and possibly even some comfort. But it made her life more difficult in the long run, as we'll see, as we'll see shortly. So before Tika Brazova left Petrograd, she arranged to have her household effects, her, her furnishings, her linens, her dishware, shipped to Armavir. But with the rail line severed, this quickly became impossible, and she was left with no choice but to consign her possessions to a warehouse in the city, and also to the, the will of fate. She made a beeline for this warehouse as soon as she returned to Petrograd on December 30th, 1920, three years after she had left. During this time, she quickly learned, her possessions, like so many other things, had been declared the legal property of the Soviet state of the city of Petrograd and of the people themselves, many times over, in fact. In a series of decrees issued in 1918 and 1919, the Bolsheviks famously nationalized the means of production in the Soviet Republic, things like large factories, banks, coal, and gold mines. Other industrial objects were, industrial objects were declared the property of the Soviet state. Less famously, but on an even wider scale, local governments followed the central government's lead, 
municipalizing, as they called it, material resources such as apartment buildings, trams, buses, parks, bookshops, clothing retailers, restaurants, to name just a few. The warehouse that held Tikhabrazova's household had also been municipalized by the city of Petrograd, just three months, in fact, before she returned. Prior to that, it had already been nationalized, and if this is getting confusing, that's the point, uh, by a, a separate decree the previous year. To make things more complicated still, as a subsequent investigation would reveal, both of these decrees had been overturned by the day that Tika Brazova herself reappeared in Petrograd, at which time the legal standing of the warehouse was, if not unknown, at the very least, shall we say, subject to dispute. Tika Brazova knew none of this, however, herself, the day she turned up at the warehouse trying to reclaim her goods. New Year's Eve, in fact, 1920. She was unceremoniously barred from entry by the warehouse director, and he referred her instead to something called the Troika dealing with seized goods. Initially, this Troika, which was led by a certain comrade Kimber, refused to satisfy Tika Brazova's demand that she be given access to her things on the grounds that they were no longer hers, having been declared the property of both the city and the central state, if not one, then the other, while she was away. But Tika Brazova was stubborn. She took her case to the Petrograd Soviet, whose director lent her his personal support in the form of a letter, a handwritten note, at which point the Troika relented, granting her household goods sufficient for two people, quote, according to the full norm, which is not usually how norms work, according to the full norm, that is, including a samovar. But there was a catch. According to the Troika, these goods could not come from Tika Brazova's own possessions allegedly because they had been taken onto the city's accounts by an organization, also very confusing for her, called Cherez Uchot, and taken possession of by a different institution called Petro Kamuna. They would come instead, not from her own possessions, which it was said had been dispersed, but from the general fund of seized goods. Still unsatisfied, Tika Brazova filed a lawsuit against Comrade Kimber, this chairman of the Troika dealing with seized goods, and with the neighborhood people's court, which found in her favor on grounds of legal proceeding, but still when Kimber failed to appear twice to hear the charges. Tika Brazova was thus assigned a court executor who accompanied her to this warehouse to get her things, but when she got there, the warehouse director still refused to let her in, shrieking at her, quote, get out of here, it is not yours, it is all the people's. The court executor left, but Tika Brazova stayed behind, and it sounds as if she spent some time just standing, lingering at the fence, at the gate, the entryway to the warehouse. Or possibly that someone else had told her already that contrary to what she'd learned, what she'd been told by Kimber, her things did still exist, that they had not been taken onto account, and that they were still standing where she had left them in the warehouse. However it happened, when she was standing around at the gate, Tika Brazova claimed that she saw her things. She saw them there in the warehouse, and right then and there, she began to cry. A sympathetic warehouse worker approached her through the fence, asking, quote, why are you crying so bitterly? And Tika Brazova answered, I have been left destitute. They have taken everything. Even the remembrances of my relatives are gone, even the album of pictures. The girl asked what her album looked like, and a few minutes later, she returned with it, giving it to Tika Brazova along with a permission slip that she needed to take it out of the warehouse and back to her home. We don't know how Tika Brazova's story ends. No resolution is clear from the archival files that I read dealing with the case, which are held in the institution, in, in the archives of an institution called the Rabkrin, or the Worker Peasant Inspectorate, whose job, role in the case was extinguished once the Petrograd Soviet agreed to issue a decision on it. But we don't need to know its outcome in order to use Tika Brazova's case to illustrate an episode in the history of the revolution that usually stays in the dark, the metaphorical, the metaphorical morning after. The histories of revolution tend to get written in front heavy ways with a lot of attention to causes and origins, the collapse of old regimes, the relative strength and tactics of revolutionary parties, the role of war in dissolving or changing societies. 
And the history of the Russian Revolution is no different. It has produced as a result of a luminous and important literature on the fragility of the Russian autocracy, the modernizing but also destabilizing wartime innovations, the politicization of the imperial military, the ideologies of the parties, to name just a few. Rather than talking to you today about the causes or, causes or origins of the revolution, about which so much great literature has been written, I'm going to talk about this period for which the revolutionaries themselves were unprepared, which they did not foresee and for which they had not planned, which was the revolution's end. Tikha Brazova's case takes us deep into the post-revolutionary landscape, the morning after revolution, a moment when the Bolsheviks sought to turn from the task of seizing power to the challenge of using it. It illustrates two particular features of the post-revolutionary landscape with which the Bolsheviks would struggle, one you likely already noticed, uh, and one that will emerge with special force during the course of our discussion today. The first is the problem of power in this world of Tikha Brazova's lost things, the institutional cacophony that she immediately is sucked into upon returning to Petrograd. Infinite numbers, it would seem to her, of official bodies to which she appealed in her attempts to gain access to, and let's review precisely what was at stake, one table, four chairs, two beds, the corresponding linens, dishware, a samovar, and a certain number of articles of winter and summer clothing. There are multiple logics of power at work in this story, no less than multiple institutions. The executor of the people's court fulfills his official duty to the letter, neither falling short of nor exceeding the mandate he was given to execute the court's ruling. Yet not everyone at work in this institutional landscape seems to share his view as we see from the outsized roles played by two people in this saga, Comrade Kimber of the Troika and the warehouse director, who seems to have taken something like an oath of fealty to Kimber. The problem is not simply one of institutional volume, but of authority. All doors to the warehouse passed through Kimber, the petty dictator of the Kokorevsky storeroom where her things were held. And so for all of its astonishing smallness, Tika Brazova's plight situates us at the heart of the central dilemma of the post-revolutionary era which is how to create an authoritative state. It also sheds light on the ideological confusion that reigned across early Soviet society and within Soviet institutions, even those at the regime's very center and in the birthplace of revolution in the city of Petrograd. Tika Brazova's case proved difficult to resolve, not only because of the institutional morass, but also because there was neither a settled body of law nor an informal but shared sensibility about the nature of possession and the possessive relationship in a socialist society. So if you're the Bolsheviks trying to make a socialist revolution, it doesn't get much deeper than the two issues put on the table in Tika Brazova's story, the creation of an authoritative state and the reconceptualization of possession and property. In the time I have remaining, I'd like to suggest that the two key dilemmas in early Soviet society, these two key dilemmas were worked out in tandem through a process of clarification and simplification applied in the beginning of the early 1920s, or applied beginning in the early 1920s to the messy history of the revolution that had come just before, through an activist process, that is, of ending the revolution, of putting an end to the revolutionary process. At stake was the practice of dispossession, of taking things from those who possessed them in order to give them to others, to enjoy them for oneself, or to relinquish them to the authority of some greater body to dispose of as it saw fit. Dispossession in the form of theft, looting, and other uh, forms of official and unofficial seizure is a phenomenon that's common to virtually all revolutions. Not all revolutions, however, are founded on dispossession. Not all revolutions stake their legitimacy on the elimination of private property. Caught between its desire to advance the cause of socialism, its need for material resources, and its inability to stop a practice that was revealed to have powerful social purchase, which is to say dispossession. From, the found, from its founding in 1917 to the end of 1920, the Bolshevik regime allowed questions of possession and seizure to fester in a capacious blind spot, pervasive but unregulated, at once official and unofficial, legal and illegal. As long as dispossession continued to flourish, no form of possession was stable, even when the objects involved were extremely important or were possessed by extremely important people. Beginning at the end of 1920, as the regime turned its attention from civil war toward the tasks of governance, 
It sought to put a stop to seizure in its most robust forms. But these efforts were beset by two problems. First, in many places, particularly those conquered more recently by the Red Army in the Civil War, far from Petrograd, the whirlwind of dispossession simply would not stop. Simply inadequate to the task, the efforts that were uh, made are the, is the substance of reports that were sent back from Siberia to the center, reporting on the popularity of a phenomenon that they called red banditry. At the same time, the regime's limited efforts to shut down dispossession had an unexpected side effect in that they drew forth a deluge of petitions from those who had lost things, like Tikha, like Tikha Brazova, over the previous three years, and now, using the new rules, sought to have them returned. Such petitions proved a thorn in the side that would not go away. As we will see, it took Bolshevik officials more than two years into 1923 to determine how to answer the difficult questions that they posed, how to restore property rights or individual possessions in a way that did not legitimate possession, or how to end what was supposed to be an endless revolution. So first, let's take a brief look at the phenomenon of dispossession in the revolutionary process. It would be lost to us as a matter of historical record were it not for this deluge of documents and petitions that I mentioned just now that were produced around the same time as Tico Brazova's case file, starting in the last few months of 1920 and continuing for more than two years into early 1923, trying to accomplish essentially the same thing that Tico Brazova's case was trying to accomplish, the return of personal possessions that one way or another had been lost during the previous years of revolution. Uh, as a branch of the Commissariat of Government Control, which is the precursor to the other institution that I speak about in this talk, Rob Crean, the Worker President Inspectorate, as, as this commissariat reported in October 1918, in Moscow, as in other populated places of Soviet Russia, the requisition of the movable property of citizens, so things that move as opposed to things that don't move, like buildings, although buildings were, of course, also being requisitioned at that same time. The problem when you requisition buildings, of course, is that they can't be picked up and moved. You've got to pick up and move the people instead. So, but movable possessions uh, is occurring by the orders of various powers. In contrast to the property transfers underway due to what was called the municipalization of real estate, which in the department's view, although this is very incorrect, by its very nature could easily be registered, the personal possessions, the movable possessions being seized by all kinds of orders, by separate groups, by the directive of individual people, their right to do so founded on the simple fact of their having a piece of paper, of their having been sent to the place of requisition with several armed people, were in distinct danger of escaping state control. Uh, ob objects as diverse as foodstuffs being held by their owners in quantities excluding even the suspicion of speculation, clothing, domestic objects, valuables, money, artistic objects, books, and objects of scientific importance were being requisitioned without any kind of registration whatsoever. It was impossible to discern any common method for requisition or even an official institution that was charged with overseeing the process. Summing up the legal uncertainty surrounding the practice of seizure, the department posed these questions, none of which would receive an answer for almost two years. To whom, through what body, where, and for what goals are requisitions of personal possessions permitted? And what kinds of possessions exactly? On what basis, equalizing or otherwise, and by what norms should requisition be conducted? How are requisition goods to be understood? On whom lies the responsibility for all these goods from the moment of their alienation? to their release from a storage space, either to individual people or institutions. As I said, these questions received no official answers. This report was ignored uh, entirely. Other branches of the government began to approach these issues approximately a year and a half later, during which time what we can think of as a whirlwind of dispossession thrived. In the absence of law, both legitimate and illegitimate acts of dispossession proliferated. This continued a trend that had begun in the First World War, when the, gar when the czarist government sanctioned the dispossession of so-called enemy aliens, who were often Jews, uh, and looked the other way when these measures were applied opportunistically. After the February Revolution, the scale of such attacks expanded, as did instances of what would be classified under the imperial legal code as property crimes. But ordinary theft, as the reviled czarist police force melted away, really began to gain steam only in the final months of the summer of 1917, turning into the fall and the October Revolution. After October, the formal and informal seizure of 
assets by people calling themselves state agents exploded, as did rates of theft, that is, extraction by people who did not bother to call themselves state agents. In truth, this was virtually the only distinction between requisition and theft, whether the people engaged in it claimed to be part of the revolutionary state. And even this was often impossible to discern. Most instances of dispossession occurred in a sort of nether region between the two. Technically, uh, epitomized by the phenomenon, I should say, of the search. Technically, searches were the province of the Chaka, the revolutionary secret police who were known to perform them not just of individual apartments, but sometimes of entire apartment buildings, usually in the middle of the night. So as one might imagine, opportunities for personal benefit, for personal profit, were plentiful in this setting. One Muscovite recalled of the winter of 1918 that there was, quote, not one night when searches were not conducted in Moscow. Who and by what right forced themselves into rich apartments, stole all kinds of things, beat people up, murdered the inhabitants was not clear. Lawful organs of power did this, bands of anarchists did this, and the most ordinary bandits did this. Did this. They limited themselves to the declaration that they were searching for counter-revolutionaries. They looked for counter-revolutionaries and they took the valuables. That, that quotation was written by a man who would subsequently emigrate from Russia, who can be termed a member of the White Guard. But we should note that the guise of agent of the Chaka became popular enough among the city's thieves that Felix Derzhinsky, head of the Chaka, found it necessary in 1918 to publish a notice instructing the public to allow only document-carrying Czechists to search their homes. So just you know, at 2 a.m. when your door is being knocked on, you do have to stop and ask for the papers, is what Derzinski was trying to get across. He threatened impersonators with death. For the ruse to bear weight, of course, it had to have substance and actual fact. And indeed, by the end of 1918, as a government investigator, part of this institution I've been mentioning, Rob Crin, concluded in an internal report to Lenin, the Cheka had amassed not only untold fortunes of gold and other valuables, but vast stocks of children's toys, now spoiled wine, kitchen utensils, and other objects. It even operated a shop where it sold seized goods at a discount to its own agents. Other agencies occasionally rebuked the Cheka for its tolerance of light-fingered agents. But they also depended on it to provide them with scarce material resources that had been seized in the course of its work, such as typewriters, material for suits, shoes for their wives and children. Institutions grabbed what they could of the objects that were being transferred to the state purview. And the numerous institutions springing up to manage these large quantities of personal property, mostly household goods, that were being seized from individuals, such as those identified in the Tikha Brazova document, Petro Komuna, Terezu Chot, these were no different. Obstacles to the regulation of this type of activity were multiple. Just to give one example, in 1918, the Chaka, taking heat from the Sovnarkom, the executive body of the Soviet regime, in particular for its alleged malfeasance, decided to implement a new procedure for its agents to adhere to during the search. They were to create a detailed inventory listing every object that they seized in the search with a detailed description and a statement of the object's value that was to be signed by the subject of the search and witnessed by a representative of the apartment building committee. Complaints would not be accepted, search subjects were warned, about objects that were not listed on the inventory. The problem, complained one person who experienced this procedure, was that if the agent decided to pocket something in the course of a search without listing it on the inventory, a person, in order to lodge a successful complaint, a person would need to already have composed a complete inventory of all their possessions prior to the search, something that virtually no one would have had on hand would have done. An additional hurdle to the regulation was the fact that many instances of dispossession unfolded beyond official notice or subverted official actions entirely. By their nature, these encounters bypassed state records. And this is why I say that it's really thanks to the documents created in the 1920s when people are trying to get things back that we know what seizure looked like in 1918. Um, these records suggest that such instances of seizure were in fact quite commonplace. In the absence of formal rules around dispossession or even a legal definition of the two terms by which dispossession usually went, requisition and confiscation, such actions would have been very difficult to prosecute. Anecdotal evidence suggests that most people either kept silent or came to, pre to private agreements with the people who had taken their things. We have several records of those sorts of agreements. 
um, or found other ways of getting even with those people. The revolutionary institutional setting was, was ripe for personal score settling. The whirlwind of dispossession is not commonly grouped among the major instances of mass expropriation of the 20th century, which particularly in the case of actions against Jews during the Second World War, directly linked the loss of things to the loss of life. As in the Nazi case, dispossession in Soviet Russia precipitated a large and ineffective bureaucracy to manage seized goods. In Vichy, France, for example, this bureaucracy was tasked with sorting and preparing goods for shipment east for use by German colonists in Poland and beyond. But in fact, most of the goods taken from French Jews never left Paris and languished instead in warehouses until the end of the war when the French government tried and failed to come up with a plan to return them, a process that it began in earnest only in the late 1990s. Tellingly, the Bolsheviks didn't do much better at the task of distributing what had been seized. An inspector of one Petrograd warehouse in 1919 that was stuffed to the gills with seized goods, many of which had been ruined at this point by mold and vermin, lamented in his official report that it was, quote, as if the city of Petrograd had no need of these things, as if there were not hunger and freezing that had led many in the city to perish. Also, like the Nazi case, dispossession in Soviet Russia often had a punitive exclusionary valence aimed at members of the possessing classes. But as we know from the complaints, just as often it went off the rails, falling on workers or others who were supposed to be favored by the new regime. As in Nazi-occupied France, dispossession was experienced as dehumanizing. And yet, in Soviet Russia, that was not actually the point. The Bolsheviks did not accept the relationship between property and power on which the French Republic and all republics previously had been founded. Where bourgeois nations accepted and celebrated property and possessing things, mediating relationships to others and the state through material objects, and naturalized this relationship as fundamental to the human condition, the Bolsheviks sought to transform humanity, to restore objects to their proper place among men, not fetishes, as Marx called objects that had been transformed into commodities, but mere things. Being human in a socialist society meant precisely creating this new relationship to things. So those who were dispossessed in the revolutionary era, however it happened, were in a certain respect not victims but pioneers, setting off into this brave new world. Let's turn now to repossession, which began, as I note, in, the early, in early 1920. Needless to say, this was not this, this uh, suggestion that, that those who had lost things be viewed as pioneers rather than victims. This was not how many of them experienced their loss. We see this in the petitions they wrote shortly after the regime accidentally opened up a window to the possibility of return, the return of the many lost things that had been languishing in warehouses and neighbors' rooms and old apartments from which the owners had been evicted. In April 1920, the Sovnarkom issued a decree on requisitions and confiscations, the first of its kind that failed to curb the practice of dispossession, judging from its repeated reissuing over the next two years, but powerfully influenced popular and legal understandings of possession and the events of the previous two years. Though modest in form, the decree provoked an immediate outburst of popular inquiry, aimed not at its meaning for the future, but rather at its implications for the past. In an effort to manage the upset, cities created these troikas on requisitions and confiscations, the troikas dealing with seized goods, that they empowered to consider all manners relating to the requisition and confiscation of things of domestic use, which were the most contentious category of goods that had been seized, up to and including the uncomfortable question of return. The troikas ultimately were not equipped to do more than fiddle along the edges of the revolutionary material regime. They were empowered to acknowledge individual instances of improper seizure, but their intention, their purpose, was to uphold the order of this seizure as a whole. Rarely, however, did they accomplish even this, as we saw in the complaint of citizeness Tika Brazova. Let's return to her now to wrap up the fate of dispossessed goods and possessions as the Bolsheviks tried to end this whirlwind of dispossession and to reinstate some form of legal order to the owning of things. So thanks to Tika Brazova's determination, Multiple her refusal to accept the full norm of someone else's goods. Multiple institutions had the opportunity to rule on her case. While some sided with her on procedural grounds, 
None took the view that Tika Brazova should get her possessions back because she had a positive right to them. As one of the institutions that sided against Tikha Brazova, the Petrograd Regional Department of Justice explained, it had arrived at its decision, quote, not only on the basis of formal juridical conceptions, but also on the basis of a vision of the revolution as a local experience, grounded fundamentally in dispossession. The, the Department of Justice wrote, it must be borne in mind that precisely during those years in which citizeness Tikha Brazova was with her son in the Caucasus, so she says, the citizens of Petrograd, alongside colossal voluntary donations of things, linens, and the like for the Red Army, were burdened additionally with a series of forced obligations. The WP, worker peasant government, cannot allow that in the same time, the things of individual citizens stored in warehouses should somehow be protected from all such assessments. In response to Tika Brazova's defense that she could not have read the Petrograd papers, where the city's seizure decrees were published because these papers did not circulate in the city of Armavir where she'd been living, the Justice Department said basically, that's the point. The same was true of, quote, all those who abandoned Petrograd after the October Revolution, a fact that, quote, the Council of People's Commissars, the Sovnarkom of the Commune of the Northern Oblast undoubtedly took into account in formulating this decree. In arguing that Tika Brazova deserved to have her things seized now, although they were still intact and the laws at the present moment did not allow for such a seizure. So in arguing that Tika Brazova deserved to have her things seized now precisely because they had not been seized in the original whirlwind, the Justice Department created a narrative of the October Revolution as a sequence of events that could be progressive, that could change without contradiction, fixed in a local frame. More concretely, it affirmed the centrality of dispossession to the experience of revolution, without which membership in the present day body politic, despite the new legal order sanctioning private possession, was impossible. This is a critical point because it illustrates the extent to which the experience of the revolution could not be extinguished or eliminated, even when the policies of the Soviet Republic, in the eyes of both its critics and its most loyal defenders, had shifted away from the more radical strategies to building socialism, toward policies that looked and felt alarmingly like capitalism, as they did with the dawn of the new economic policy. In the months that followed, the Sovnarkom was forced by a continuing barrage of petitions seeking the return of seized goods to revisit the legal format of dispossession. In October 1921, it released a new decree on requisitions and confiscations with an explanatory note from the Commissariat of Justice, directly addressing the problem of return for the first time. The note decisively rejected not only the possibility of restoring lost properties, but also of investigating the past in any way. It legitimated the whirlwind by ending it and normalized it by declaring it exceptional. Quote, before the publication of the decree of 15th April 1920, Narkom used explained, there existed no definite and precise legal definition of requisition and confiscation. Forced alienation occurred at the direction of central and local, higher and lower authorities, elementally and without order, in an atmosphere of sharp civil war. So overpowering was this disorder that it was deemed, quote, impossible today to enter into a discussion about the evaluation of all the requisitions and confiscations that took place up to 15th April 1920. So because this period lacked a legal order, it was thus declared also to lack a history. The whirlwind became a time outside of time. The same was not true of requisition and confiscation occurring after the decree entered into force from 16th April 1920 this new decree specified, because the existence of a legal order made it possible for the first time to identify lawbreakers who were characterized as wayward state agents and who could now be understood as the sole perpetrators of crime that depended on clear boundaries between state and non-state, official and unofficial, precisely the sort of boundaries that had not in fact existed during the whirlwind itself. So recreating anarchic dispossession as crime on the job was, as, as it was known, was a step toward building the state and its agents into a discrete entity, distinct from a society upon which it could act. Gone was the story of neighbors and the spoilage of interpersonal relations, replaced by a void that would brook no investigation, followed by the reappearance of officials who may or may not have adhered to the law, 
Experiences of dispossession that did not conform to this tableau were consigned to silence. This silence did not come easily. In March 1922, the Sovnarch Home found it necessary to issue yet another decree on, this on dispossession, this one having nothing to do with its current practice and dedicated solely and exclusively to the problem of return. It was called the Order on the Demand of Property, in, the, in Russian rendered as imushustva, by previous owners, rendered in Russian as sobstvenikami, from current possessors, rendered as vladeltsev. So that is three different words for property and possession that were at play in this decree. None of them described, suggesting the continued confusion that is persisting around the concept at this moment. So this order sought to suppress encounters, personal encounters, between people who had lost things, namely, again, this very contentious category of household goods, and those who had gained them, encounters that had evidently grown common in post-revolutionary society. Like the earlier order, this one aimed to legitimate the whirlwind by restructuring it, creating these pockets of silence around certain kinds of dispossession while throwing others open to revision. This restructuring occurred along several lines. First was a movement through government organs, which was deemed cleansing of past traces of ownership. So anything that had been in official hands at any point, anything that had sat in a warehouse that had been possessed by the state at any point could now never be returned. Second was the issue of time. The decrees created complicated timelines, sectioning off whole years of the revolutionary era as lost to the past and thus unrecoverable. Places that were conquered by the Bolsheviks later than, say, Petrograd, places like Siberia, were not made to implement the current policies of Petrograd. That is, no dispossession, keep track of all the stuff. That's what Petrograd's got going right now. But rather, these places were given an additional year to experience the whirlwind of dispossession in the revolutionary setting, to experience the disorder. The decree declared that the March 1920 firewall, firewall that had been created was invalid in Siberia, the Southeast region, and in the Crimea, territories the Red Army had conquered more recently, in which the period specified in the article is reduced, which is set at two years, is reduced to one year. So having started later on the Bolshevik charted path to revolution, these regions would be given an extension on their whirlwinds, an additional year during which forms of dispossession that were now understood as criminal could persist. The decree protected this special revolutionary era, not just for those who had experienced it, but for all those who might yet experience it in the future. So again, we see this critical feature of how the revolution worked. Not certain policies during revolution succeeded by new policies and experience afterwards, but rather that what followed was explicitly premised on what had come before, to the point that the authorities were willing to let whole chunks of their territory languish in disorder so that the residents might experience the same revolution, the true revolution, the one had, that had obtained in Petrograd. And with that, I'll end. It's, it's time to close. Thank you. Nothing. <laughs> it takes, it usually takes a little? Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> Do I have to like introduce myself? Or am I good? Do yes? Oh, yeah. uh, I'm Ruger Mehmet, I'm a Russian major. Um, um, I have a question about like the reason why dispossession was such a thing. You you touched on it obviously. You talked about how it was kind of like an ideological thing. They were trying to make everybody experience the revolution. But was that the only actual reason why it was so sanctioned in many different ways, or was it? Were there other things that they were trying to get out of it? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so first, I would I would say that perhaps surprisingly, and despite a sort of stereotypical shorthand that we have for the revolution, particularly conservative commentators on the revolution who like to criminalize it, 
will point to something Lenin said, you know, uh, what is it? Steal from the thieves, rob from the robbers. Um, the Bolsheviks were extremely anti-stealing and, and theft. As soon as they seized power, they wanted a functioning society. In fact, it's one of the most remarkable aspects of the first months and years of their governance, of their patterns of governance, that they really seemed to think that they could sit themselves in this car that they'd taken, that they'd like found lying on the side of the road and just make the thing go. So they didn't want people to be, you know, perpetrating theft against each other every night. Um, but they did believe in uh, the reallocation of material things as being the first step, not just to rendering a more just society, but to changing people, to changing human nature. Um, which was at the core of their project, that the only way... So, so it was certainly an ideological mm -hmm. project. In terms of other things they got out of it, as I mentioned, um, there are, you know, they... Uh, they distribute the spoils to an extent among themselves. But what's truly remarkable, more even than the kinds of... Um, gift making that we see in the upper levels of the regime, which is not just in the upper levels, and they struggle with it a lot. So like they end up with these huge collections of gold watches, for example, that they don't really know what to do with and they start to give them to firefighters at a certain point when they've like really successfully fought a fire. Um, they're very worried about the fact that some of these watches are engraved because these will bear traces of previous owners and it's unclear from documents whether they themselves are anxious about that connection to per personal owners or whether they're always extremely aware of how this all is being viewed in the West. They're very concerned about that and, and the implications of that for their legitimacy as a governing authority. So there are practical, tangible uses of these goods, but the big story in seizure is how much is just lost, okay. how much perishes. You see this more than anywhere else. A, a different portion of my work looks at buildings as a resource, the creation of this thing that became very important in Bolshevik governance called living space, but which didn't exist as, as a resource, as a concrete unitary asset prior to the revolution. Um, and you look at the, the building stock, the numbers of building stock, it, it falls by more than a third. And they're not building anything new, so it's just really a story of loss most respects. So you can't make, it's impossible to make a neat connection between these people lost it and these people gained it. More often than not, these people lost it and it was just never seen again. Thank you. you mentioned that uh, one of the goals of the Bolshevik revolution mm -hmm. was to change human nature. Mm -hmm. Do they feel like they were successful in the culture. So, uh, so the question is uh, that one of the goals of the Bolshevik Revolution was to change human nature, and do they feel, did they feel that they were successful in doing that? Certainly not, certainly not by the moment when I leave them in the early 1920s. Um, this is the broader narrative of Soviet history in many critical respects, is a, you know, a, a sort of bubbling optimism in the 1920s that human nature can be changed and that they will get there eventually to a much more uh, restrained stance on that possibility, the, the continued deferral of the moment of what, was, what came to be called conventionally as the transition from socialism to communism. So socialism was understood to be a sort of transitory state. It was not the permanent state of communism, which is when we could expect that human nature had been changed. It was, as, as you will undoubtedly know, it was a, a deeply utopian and, and, and project um, and a, a quasi-religious in, in many respects in the idea of a, a sort of um, progress to, to perfection in that sense. My name's Emily, I'm also a Russian major. Um, I'm just curious, you probably um, kind of summarized this before, but how did this confusion of policies and confiscation, how did that affect the, uh, the economy of this new government? Badly. <laughs> um, in a nutshell. Uh, 
the Bolsheviks learn, and this is this is one of the broader uh, issues that I struggle with in my work, is the extent to which there is a certain degree of, um, how to put it, a coming to grips with the idea that some of these projects might simply not be possible to implement in the early 1920s, that a set of Soviet economists come to come around to that realization actually very on, very early on in the game. And um, you know, one of the lessons that they take away from this, and you see this again in the, in the management of buildings, is that they come to believe that when people do not own things, they do not care for them. And so a great deal of effort is expended on trying to cultivate behaviors of care for spaces that are not owned. Um, and this is to a certain extent successful for, for a long time. I mean, this is, this is, these are all much bigger questions about, and this is good, this is, this is really good, because it connects this story to the, the larger project of, of building socialism and the moment in which in the 1930s, a mobilizational regime can keep people attached to these things and keep them engaged and the ways in which the possibilities for that change over time. Mm -hmm. So very badly, it affects, yeah. it affects the regime, but not just that, certainly. I mean, there are, there are the chaos is deeply destructive to, to economic order, um, but the fact of the matter is that the Russian economy was in quite rough shape by the time the Bolsheviks came into power, so. It was already bad when they came into power. It is. It is. This is. This is in large part why the February Revolution unfolded at the moment that it did, because the imperial government was the first of the combatants in the First World War to crack under the strains of total war. That the the imperial government was unable to provide its people with food mm -hmm. um, and its soldiers with weapons, mm -hmm. and then it started to come undone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn, European studies major. Um, in their efforts to reshape the human nature of the people that they were now ruling, mm -hmm. did, is there records that they made the same sacrifices themselves and ditched some of their own personal property to free themselves? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, one of the things about the, um, particularly the first cohort of Bolshevik leaders, and they're much praised for this subsequently, is that they're, extreme, they're extremely ascetic. Lenin is famously so. Um, Lenin famously lives in, you know, a, a bare a bare room with whitewashed walls and slip covered sofas and nothing else. He needs only his books. He doesn't even eat. Like so, th so there is obviously a certain level of exaggeration to some of this, but there's no doubt that it was real as well. There's no doubt that, um, you know, but. But obviously, the ways in which the allocation of things and the operation of power become entangled very early on are, are profoundly important for how the regime comes to function, such that you know, um, the state almost immediately becomes the path to survival for not just the elites, but for much of the Russian citizenry after the war. So, so the, the, the significance of these rewards that the state can offer in the form of very modest material things is nevertheless very significant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think our time is at a conclusion. If we can just thank uh, Dr. Thank you all.